Good morning, church. I invite you to stand as we worship the Lord together. Sing with me. Here's to the one who made the morning bright. Here's to the one who taught the stars to shine. Here's to the one who graced the dead of night. Pull me from the dark, set my heart alight. Oh. Here's to the one who made my heart to sing. Open up my eyes, wash away my sin. Here's to the one who gave his life for mine. Broke all my chains and set me free, all right. To the Christ. Give him a handshake or a hug. As you're making your way back to your seats, if you would remain standing as you are able, as we join together in affirming our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed as our guide. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, 
the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. Well, good morning, church. Good morning. Uh, my name is Jason. I'm one of the pastors here at Covenant. If I hadn't had the chance to meet you yet, it's an honor and privilege to uh, have you with us in worship. I hope I get the chance to meet you after worship. There are a couple of cards in the seat backs in front of you. Uh, one is a I'm New card. That's for you if you're a guest. We would love to be able to connect with you. The Lord has uh, given us a grand vision that we would be a community connecting in Christ. And that starts with the way in which we love and care for one another, get to know one another. I hope that you'll fill out that contact information. You could uh, drop it in the offering plate later in worship. There's also a prayer card. Uh, we hope, a desire, look forward to the opportunity to come alongside you in prayer. If there's a prayer on your heart, in your life, uh, I hope that you'll write that down and if you will drop it in the, uh, in the offering plate later. Uh, a word about that. I want you to know, and the staff members are laughing, uh, I want you to know that uh, we get 15 or 20 prayer cards every week. And I want you to know that the vast majority of those come from children and students in English worship and Spanish worshipers. So it starts to make me wonder, is there a little like, like hesitancy for some of our adult English worshipers to lift up their hearts in prayer? I hope not. I hope that you know that we want to pray with and for you. I hope you know that this is a space where you could take those burdens and give them to the Lord, and you have people that will come alongside you in that way. So if there is a prayer on your heart, I hope that you will lift that up in that way. I have a couple of uh, specific invitations. The first is we are uh, building uh, and developing the small group ministry of the church, and we know that many of you have a desire to be a part of a small group. Uh, we have created this interest, and in, uh, Zach, as our, our pastor of uh, discipleship, is interested in connecting you to the right group and uh, to reaching out. If you'd like to be a part of a small group, just click that QR code really quick, lay out the, your interest, and then we will reach out to you and find a way to connect you in. Uh, that's also found on our website and our church center app. And then I also want to share that today is... Uh, the one Sunday a year where we have uh, a really joyful uh, opportunity for some family business. Uh, we have been in our annual giving drive at the church, and uh, this is a time where we make our annual commitments to the financial uh, resourcing of the ministry. And so I'm going to just give a little mechanics of this. If you don't have your card with you, uh, we have some available on the on the back table uh, during the uh, during some worship time later on, you could uh, meet Kirk back there. He'll have one. If you pledged online, we would love for you to be able to participate in this time of commitment and offering. Uh, and there's a little box that you could say pledged online. You can just check that. Uh, we're going to approach the altar. We're going to leave uh, our prayer card, our, our pledge cards uh, for Commitment Sunday here in the chest and our offerings in the offering plate. Uh, that's going to be after the sermon at an offering time. Just wanted you to be aware of what those mechanics look like if you need to attend to something between now and then. We are going to enter into a time of prayer, but before we do, we're, uh, we're going to intercede as, as an opportunity for celebration and rejoicing uh, over a great uh, witness. Yesterday, our pastor, Dario Vargas, was ordained, come forward, Dario, ordained... <laughs> All the way up, all the way up, all the way up. Yes. Yes. Doesn't he look awesome? Yeah. Well, I'm gonna, y'all can just remain standing. Y'all don't have to sit back down. Hey, uh, so he looks so good. This, this stole. Uh, he, was, he was ordained by Bishop Jones and Bishop Webb. He was stoled. I had the honor of, of stoling him. And uh, he is now an elder in the Global Methodist Church. And uh, he has been ordained. And so we celebrate his ministry. All that that means, the, the work of preparation, uh, the work of studying, the work of, of uh, preparing his heart and responding to God's call on his life. So we're going to pray over him. If you would extend a hand in prayer, uh, we'll bless him and his ministry and then pray uh, for what God is doing in worship this morning. Lord, we come before you uh, celebrating uh, the work of your hand in Dario's life. 
Uh, we celebrate uh, his family and, and their faithful response to his call and walking alongside of him in this season. Lord, we celebrate uh, the 90 ordinances that, uh, that, that were ordained yesterday in College Station. And we ask, Lord, that you would bless their ministries. Specifically, Lord, we pray that you would uh, pour out your Holy Spirit upon Dario, that you would use him for your glory in, uh, in, in Covenant's ministry and in our community, that, that the, the way in which uh, we are one in you uh, through your son, Jesus Christ, no matter our language or race or nationality, Lord, we pray that that would be uh, known and evident through the ministry that he leads in. Lord, we ask that you would uh, pour out your spirit upon our gathering of worship, that you would be glorified in all that takes place in this space and this time. We give you honor, praise in all things, and especially in this time of worship. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. You can remain standing if you want to stand while we sing together. Friends, I just want to encourage you and worship this morning. You have a God who loves to hear you sing. You have a God who loves to hear you sing even if you aren't good at it. Uh, he doesn't judge your worship by the sound of your voice, but by the cry of your heart. I invite you, even if you don't normally sing out loud, that today, maybe you try it. Maybe you sing loud as an offering of your heart to your Father God who loves the sound of your voice. Let's sing together. As the Spirit was moving over the water, Spirit, come move over us. Come rest on us. Come rest on us. As the Spirit was moving over the water, Spirit, come move over us. Come rest on us. Come rest on us. So come down, Spirit, when you move. You make my heart pound When you fill the room You're here and I know you are moving I'm here and I know you will fill me Come down Spirit, when you move You make my heart pound When you fill the room You're here and I know you are moving I'm here and I know you will fill me Man, you guys sound good this morning Keep lifting your
great. And God, your love is so much greater than any fear or anxiety that we may be feeling today. Heavenly Father, we don't always know the path of our lives. But Lord, we do know that you have a plan and a purpose for each one of us. And God, we thank you for guiding us and protecting us. And God, as we continue to journey with you, God, we will not do it in fear because we trust you, God. We know that you are faithful. We know that you're beside us and you will never forsake us. Church, please join me in praying the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray. Saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. You may be seated. Amen. And at this time, the kids are dismissed to head back to Cove Kids to have fun together to grow in your faith. Here in this space and time, we're going to dig into God's Word. Uh, we're going to be in uh, Psalm 139 this morning. Uh, we are continuing in the series, How I Met the Father. It's an opportunity for us to, to hear uh, the Word revealed in uh, lives, to hear testimony about how God has, has taken His Word and, and used it and borne witness through someone's life in a mighty, mighty way. And so, um, we've invited Megan to come forward and to offer the word, uh, but let's center our hearts and minds on Psalm 139, verses 1 through 18. You have searched me, Lord, and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise, you perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you, Lord, know it completely. You hem me in behind and before, and you lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too lofty for me to attain. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me and the light become night around me. Even the darkness will not be dark to you. The night will shine like the day, for darkness is as light to you. For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that. Full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. How precious to me are your thoughts, God. How vast the sum of them. Were I to count them, they would outnumber the grains of sand. When I awake, I am still with you. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks Thanks be to God. God. Would you pray with me?
So, Father God, we are so grateful to get to be together here today. And as your word says, where two or more are gathered in your name, you are with us. And so, God, we just recognize your presence in this place. And we ask you to do what only you can do, God, by the power of your spirit, which is teach us something more about you than we knew before we walked into this place. And would you give each of us a surrendered spirit to put aside any distractions or burdens we may have walked into this place with, lay them at your feet and simply say, Lord, what do you have for me this morning? And so, Father, we love you and we trust you. And we give you this time. And we pray all of this in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Well, for those of you that I don't know, my name is Megan Maserol, and I now serve as the youth director here at Covenant, which is funny because I wasn't here last Sunday when it was Youth Sunday. <laughs> I... I apologize for that. My sister is doing this crazy thing where she's getting married, and so I have to be there for things like a bridal shower and such. But nevertheless, uh, on my way back to Houston from the Dallas area, I was watching the service back. And y'all, we have some incredible youth, right? Yes, please testify to that. I mean, I was watching the service, watching our students lead this incredible band, watching Aiden give us a message, and I immediately called Jason after I got done listening, and I said, brother, they are coming for our jobs. <laughs> they are coming for us. It's crazy. And, but, but the fact that we have the honor here at this church to get to experience watching God work in and through the lives of our students is, in fact, that it's an honor. That, that we are watching them live out an embodiment of verses like 1 Timothy 4.12 that says, Do not let others look down upon you because you are young, but set an example for the believers in life, in love, in speech, in faith, and in purity. I believe we got a display of that last Sunday. Amen. And we're, we're getting to watch our students live out this faith unashamedly and in teaching us what it looks like to live authentically for Jesus. And in, in Aiden's sermon last week, uh, he talked about the same guy who wrote the very psalm that Jason just read, David. Aiden referred to David as the him, him of praise and worship. That when David spoke about praise and worship, you leaned in, you listened in because it was worthwhile. You were listening to the guy, the guy talk about praise and worship. And, and David became him of praise through much pain. You can see in the numerous, numerous psalms that David wrote, uh, the honesty of his worship, whether it be in times of immense joy or great, great grief. He learned that through whatever circumstance he found himself in, that he was to live a life surrendered to the one who saw him, formed him, and purposed him. And, and, and let's consider the life of David for, for just a moment, okay? Uh, David, a humble shepherd boy, the youngest of his family, yet he was anointed by Samuel to become king of Israel. And, and David grows in recognition and respect amongst the people of, of Israel, uh, but as he shows incredible bravery and courage 
in places we know as stories like David and Goliath. And in various other battle victories. And then we have times where we see almost unbelievable faith displayed by David. When the very man who hired him as a musician, aka King Saul, then turns around and flips the script and pursues David to try to kill him because he's jealous of his fame and recognition that the people of Israel are giving to David. But yet, yet we watch this radical faith happen as David exhibits humble restraint. Humble restraint and does not kill the man who is pursuing him to kill him as he trusts God to be faithful, no matter what circumstance or what the outcome may or may not be, even if that could mean his own death. And so when this man, David, writes words like, for you created me in my inmost being, you knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. We believe him because we know he really believes this. He has experienced through every encounter of his life that God is, in fact, with him. That God sees him. And what the Lord has created for David are, in fact, wonderful works, even his own life. Faith that produces truths like, your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days were ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. These truths held David strong and confident that the Lord is the one who is truly in control of all of this. And what's, what's even more interesting, as, as I've kind of pondered and reviewed over the life of David, is that his display of this kind of insurmountable faith began when he was really, really young. Started at a very, very young age. And just as we marvel at what God is doing in and through the lives of our students, I can't help but imagine that people that were older than David did the same thing marveling at him. That this this oozing out of faith that was happening, this kingdom building like faith that was coming out of a, the mouth and life of a pint-sized kid. As this young man faced circumstance after circumstance that could have produced doubt, agony, defeat, we see a strengthened faith rising all the more. I, too, uh, resonate as my conscious awareness of God's working in and through my life began at a young age. I, uh, I grew up in church. There's been a long-standing joke that they cut the umbilical cord and stuck me in my home church because my, my earliest memories were being in and around the people of God and the workings of God in the life of a local church. And so when I found myself at around six or seven years old with my grandma in my bedroom, who my grandma, my nana, uh, was a key spiritual mentor and really idol in my life. When I found us in in this place in my bedroom where she started asking me 
about Jesus and about Jesus coming into my heart, I was, I was ready. I was aware that I had a need that couldn't be fixed outside of the saving grace of Jesus. And, and I'll never forget after I uh, prayed with my grandmother and prayed for God to forgive me of my sins, for Jesus to forgive me of my sins and come in to my heart, I, uh, I leaned over to my Nana and I whispered, Nana, I feel so warm inside. I think Jesus is with me. And my Nana, sweet and spicy at the same time, <laughs> She answered, she goes, that's the Holy Spirit, Megan, and you better listen to him. Yes, (laughs) ma'am. Yes, ma'am. And the next day on the playground, I... I'm out at recess with my friends and I gathered as many of my friends as I could and I put them I put them in a circle and I began telling them how there was this really really cool guy named Jesus and they could have him in his heart too. And I just was a little uh, evangelist to to my friends on the playground. And 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 for me that is such a sweet thing to reflect on one of just childlike faith in action, but two, what a sweet foreshadowing that I could have never known. Just getting opportunities to, to stand in front of people and talk about this guy Jesus that I love. And so I met the Father first as Savior. And the one that really made my life make sense Because you see, there wasn't a lot in my life that after I met the Father in this way that just drastically, circumstantially changed. But yet, meeting the Father gave purpose and resonance and understanding to this life that I was already living with my family and my church family and everyone around me. And I was involved in every church-related thing that you could imagine. I even somehow managed, I mean, in my head, I say I managed to sneak on to the older kids' mission trip, but maybe I wasn't as sneaky as I thought. But in my head, that's how the story goes, is that I found my way to be with the older kids, with the big kids, and go on mission trips with them. Or I would travel around with my dad as he led worship, not only at our church, but in various other places. And I wanted to be around my father, so that meant continuing to come around our father. And my childlike faith was just growing and growing in pretty normal of, of circumstances. And it was, it was changing me and preparing me in ways I, I could have never imagined. Because on a, on a Saturday morning, I was 11 years old. I woke up to the sound of my mom screaming and crying. I ran and got my brother and sister, and and my mom's door to her bedroom was locked, so we couldn't go in, so we just kind of came into the living room and didn't really know what was going on or what to do. And then my grandparents showed up. And then my pastor showed up. And everybody looked really sad, but nobody would say why. And finally, uh, my mom joined us in the living room. And I'll never forget her face as she told us that. That my dad had passed away in a car accident the night before. And what became true 
of my physical state in that moment reflected the realities of my emotional state for the next several years. Because almost instantaneously as we received this news, I picked myself up off of the couch and I bolted out of my house. Ran down the street as far as my 11-year-old legs would take me and then just collapsed on the curb, sobbing in just utter disbelief. I didn't know what to do with these thoughts and emotions or really the reality that was now somehow mine. <laughs> I didn't know what to do with them other than run from them. And so that's what I did. Because since I didn't know what to do with this reality or how to help myself, surely nobody else knew how to either. The next several years of my life, the way I've, I've come to describe them is that I was in a state of existing, but not living. Like numb in the, the biggest sense of the word. Uh, I, was, I was present physically, but everything else was, was gravely lacking. And I would, I would still show up to things. I would even still show up to all my church stuff, right? I'd, I'd come, go to school. I was going through the motions of life. But if anyone tried to connect with me deeply, especially, especially about the things of my father... I would shut down and then lash out pretty aggressively. (laughs) I would smart off with phrases like, I'm I'm sorry. Did your dad die? Hmm. Uh, How about when you were my age? Or how about did this happen only a couple months after your parents got divorced? Hmm. No? No? Great. Great. And as you can imagine, that would shut down any engagement pretty quickly. And and what was even harder about this time is I didn't even let God into my pain. And it wasn't because I didn't believe that he was real. Truly, I, I never doubted in, in, this, in this time that, that God wasn't real. I still believed that he was very much alive and active and present. But because I couldn't make sense of my circumstances, I didn't understand how to come to him with my pain. And so I didn't come to him or anyone with it at all. And when I think of some of those honest psalms that David wrote, like the one that starts, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I can't help but feel seen. In in the similarity of the inner depths of my soul at that time. I knew God saw me. I just didn't know if he cared. In the summer before I went into high school, uh, I found myself at a church camp in Panama City, Florida. And it was it was pretty cool. If for nothing else, we were at a at a church camp on a beach, and I was with my youth group at the time. And it was one of those church camps where our church plus several other churches were there with their youth groups, and every night we would have this collective service together, a worship service and a message with everyone, everyone involved. But then after, after the message, you would break up into your individual church. 
and just be with your youth group and with your leader, your adult leaders that were present. And so halfway through this church camp, it's after the service, and I can't tell you what the sermon was. I can't tell you what the worship band was doing. But I distinctly remember coming back to the, to the room that we would meet in just with our church, and I looked around the room, and I felt safe. Most of the kids that were on the trip that year, gosh, some of them I'd, I'd known since we were in, in children's church together. The adult leaders that were there, I knew them all by name. Some of them had even held me in the nursery. And in, in that space of feeling, feeling safe, and known, I broke. I broke. My, my poor youth pastor at the time, he was in the middle of saying something. And I just lost it. I just started weeping and I threw open my arms physically. And I said, I am not okay and I can't pretend like I am anymore. And all that I had been running from and trying to hide away from came flooding forward. And as I'm being swept by a clear flood of emotions, there is this constant pressing thought that is not my thought being spoken over me on repeat over and over and over again. Saying, Megan, you were never meant to carry this. And if you give this to me, I'll show you that I'm worth following. And I'll show you I'm worth living for. And in this place of exposed vulnerability, I went from having only met the Father's saving grace to meeting the Father's loving heart. Realizing that God the Father loves me and loves us so much. Death was not his original design. It is only a product of sin and brokenness in our world. So God having to watch his children face the consequences of a world not being as it should breaks his heart too. And he saw mine. My aching, broken heart. And he said, I'll, I'll carry this for you, daughter. I'll put back together and make purpose out of this wreckage. And as my word promises, I'll be close to the brokenhearted. So I'll be close to you. I met the Father through the aching of grief for my earthly father. I met his goodness while he held me in circumstances that were anything but good. He showed me my purpose when I couldn't see past my ever-present pain. And it, it changed everything. It changed everything. Step by step, day by day, I watched the Lord heal my heart and walk me into his purposes for my life. 
through the continual support of my church family, my friends, my actual family. (laughs) I got to watch God work in and through this heart of mine. I was starting to see in a whole new way how scripture was true for me, too. Like Ephesians 2.10, we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus to two good works for which he prepared in advance for us. I could see how he was using my life to make him known. How my story wasn't a masterpiece ruined by tragedy, but a workmanship crafted to bring him glory. How just as it was true for David, it was true for me too that I was knit in my mother's womb. That his hand would guide me and that his right hand would hold me fast. That maybe I thought at first I could or should flee from the Father's presence. Because I didn't understand what was happening in my story. But now I saw that he was ever present. His eyes even saw me when I was just an unformed body. And as my journey with him hasn't been anything close to perfect, it's been an honest one. It's been an honest fight. Much as we see our brother David stumble at times, I too have had my fair share of wanting to run and hide my pain, my shame, and hurt from the Lord. I wrote a lot of these stories in moments down in a little book I put out this year. But what has continued to free my heart time and time again is the same truth that freed me when I was 14 years old and broken and scared and sad. It is the truth that our Father is El Roy, the God who sees me. Before a word is on my tongue, he knows it completely. He made me in the secret place. When I lie down or when I rise, he is still there with me. Because I've seen his goodness over and over and over again in my life. I am drawn back into his loving arms. Rather than running away. He called me out of darkness. He called me out of hiding my pain and shame. He is the God who sees me. And he's my father, always. Let's pray. God, thank you for the simple but profound truth that you are father. You are the father that loved us so much that you created a way for us to come running back to you. And God, because that is true, would you make it true of each of our stories that we would not run from you, but run to you because we can. This undeserved grace that we have been given This divide that was wide, that has now been brought close. Would we remember this when the lies of our pain and our shame and our hurt and our doubt and our 
our misunderstanding, our not understanding, try to tell us that you don't love us and that you are not good. God, would you make it true of our story that even in the midst of a wrestling through life and faith, that we too would be like David and be called a people after God's own heart. God, would you make it true of us? Let us be reminded how deep the Father's love is for us and that we can come out of our fear in our brokenness, in our pain, and run into the Father's arms that are here today and always. God, we love you, and we trust you, and we pray all of this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. If you would extend a hand, we're going to offer a word of blessing and thanksgiving over Megan. Lord, we come before you. Thankful for our sister Megan, thankful for her witness, Lord. You commissioned your followers to be your witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and even in the Woodlands, Texas. And you have used Megan as your witness today. Lord, we thank you for her childlike faith that knew your son, our Savior. And Lord, we pray over her brokenness, knowing that, uh, that those are wounds that we don't carry lightly, but we hand to you. So Lord, I thank you for your willingness to carry her burdens and to heal her wounds and to restore her. Lord, we thank you for a faith that is in a God who sees and in a God who knows. And so, Lord, we ask that you would see her and know her even in this moment and that she would know your Holy Spirit's presence as a source of comfort and peace and of blessing. Lord, let her witness ring powerfully through our congregation and our community. We thank you for her and for it and offer blessings upon it. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. Amen. We're going to enter into this time of commitment and of offering. Uh, if you're a guest with us, uh, normally during our time of offering, we would pass the plates, but today the offering plate is on the altar. If you're a member here, uh, I'll approach in just a moment and open the chest, and it'll be a time when we can bring our commitments to next year's, uh, next this year's, excuse me, uh, um, resources for the church. And so I invite uh, us to come in a humble spirit I also invite you to come uh, after you uh, offer those commitments and kneel at the altar and spend some time in prayer seeking God's uh, provision to sustain the pledges that are made today. Let's uh, bow for a word of prayer. Lord, we come. We come not out of obligation or of coercion, but we come in a joyful spirit, cheerfully thankful for all that you have given us. Lord, let these gifts be offering to you that would bring you glory, honor, and praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you come? Distance. 
us anymore. You're not far from home. And I'll be your lighthouse when you're lost at sea. And I will illuminate everything. No need to be frightened. Throw off your fear and come running to me. Oh, cause I loved you before. You knew it was love. I saw it all. Still I chose the cross. You were the one that I was thinking of when I rose the grave. we celebrate these your gifts that have been bestowed upon your servants for the work of ministry. Lord, we pray that you would be glorified in the use of these gifts. Lord, we pray that, that, that we would see a realized vision of a community connecting in Christ. Lord, we pray that that the, the student ministry and the, and the Cove Kids ministry and our partnership with team and the work that we have in our communities and our small group ministries would all be blessed to bring glory to your name, Lord, that the work of these gifts would be to your honor. Lord, I thank you for the servants that offer these gifts, and I ask your blessing upon them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, let's stand and sing one final song together. Wanting a place to hide this weary soul, this vagabond. I try with all my might, but I just can't win the fight. I'm slowly drifting, a vagabond. But just when I
in my docks over there, I'm telling you. Oh, just a quick uh, invitation. We do have a couple of spots left on ski trip, so if you're interested, find me or Pastor Jason after the service. Uh, receive now this benediction. God, we go forth from this place knowing and believing that you are the God who sees us. And so God, may we go in the power of that truth knowing that you are with us every step of the way. Father, we love you, and we trust you, and we pray all of this in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Go in peace. <laughs>